After leaving William Whitley and his fine brick house, he walked merrily down the trail, the miles melting under his feet. For two weeks he made good time, hunting and making camp and keeping himself scarce on the main trails. In all that time he saw few people and only saw the sign of old moccasin tracks occasionally. Before long, however, the trail entered a large cane break, and so he entered cautiously. He had never encountered such a large break before. It seemed to stretch on for miles. It was indeed a dense patch of growth, and he kept his rifle before him as he pushed through, ever wary for game or for an enemy. The sunlight of the late afternoon slanted its way through the thick cane, and there were many insects that swarmed around him as he passed by. Every once in a while, he came upon a clearing, and then the trail plunged back into the cane. But he did eventually emerge out of the cane break and into open country once more. Now, every time he came out into a clearing or field, he always stepped carefully and slowly, letting his eyes and ears adjust to the terrain while his rifle muzzle swept the vicinity far and near. He intended to do some fishing as he was traveling in the vicinity of the Kentucky River and its many tributaries. So he stopped to cut a couple of cane poles to carry with him. They were just the right length and diameter to make a very responsive fishing apparatus for the many small panfish that he hoped to have for his supper that night. The sun was still three hands from the horizon and in the distance not too far from him, he could hear the sound of water running over rocks in a large creek. The thought of fresh fish made his mouth water and his growling stomach reminded him that he had had little to eat that day in his long journey. The creek had a rocky bed, but just ahead of him he could see a gravel bar that would be just right for angling a line into a nearby pool of water where there was sure to be some fish. Standing on the bank and ever alert for any sign of trouble, he looked this way and that, but saw and heard no sign of danger. Well, it was high time to start angling. And so after he found some sticks and used them to securely prop up his rifle where it was near to hand, and then stepping back and looking around once more, checking his surroundings carefully, he went ahead and removed his pack and haversack. It was such a quiet scene around him that he soon relaxed. After the trouble of the last 20 years, it seemed that at last this bountiful land would have rest from the ravages of war. It gladdened his heart at the prospect of bringing his family up the same trail, knowing that there was a relative peace. He began preparing his pole by stripping the leaves off by hand, careful not to tear into the cane itself when doing so. It was a familiar task that he had done since he was a small boy. Then he carefully tested the strength of his new pole to see if it would bear up under the weight of a dangling fish. And then, removing the large belt knife from its leather sheath, he quickly lopped off the small end of the cane. It was too green and would snap easily, and he didn't need that, so off it went. What was left was near perfect, and it felt good to have the familiar cane pole in his hand again. Under a fallen sapling, he found some grubs and some small earthworms. These he carefully picked up and dropped into his copper drinking cup.
Returning to his pack, he opened it and extracted the angling kit of the late Ephraim Kane. Mr. Kane must have been an avid angler indeed, as he had put together a most complete and compact pocket fishing box. He selected the linen fishing line and then carefully chose a small iron hook where it had been secured into a cork. Unwinding the line, he then carefully drug it over the small block of beeswax. This would waterproof the line as well as make it easier to tie onto the hook. Then he carefully threaded the wax line through the center of the cork he would use as a float. Now, he carefully made a loop in the end of the line. This he laid alongside of the iron hook, and then he began to carefully wrap the short end around and around, back up the hook. After counting seven turns, he slides the end of the line through the loop. He pulls it tight and then holding onto the hook and the small end of the thread, he finishes the knot by pulling on the long part of the line. It will hold. He uses his patch knife and cuts off the small part of the line that's left. Next, he retrieves a small bit of sheet lead from the fishing box and wrenches and twists it back and forth until a small piece tears off. This will weight his line. He folds and pinches the thin lead around the linen line, fastening it just a few inches above the iron hook. After tying the other end of the line to his cane pole, he's now ready to bait the hook and cast the line. Three fish are enough for his supper, and it's all that will fit into his small pan anyway. So he reshoulders his pack, his haversack, and his canteen. He 
then retrieves the rifle and picks up his catch of fish. Now it's getting late and it's time to find a place for the night. It appears like some clouds have moved in and sure looks like rain is on the way. He finds a nice spot on some level ground not too far from the creek bank. Well, it looks safe enough, and there's definitely a good field of fire. Satisfied, he sets the cane pole against the tree, as well as his rifle. He's getting a mite thirsty, so he unslings the canteen and drinks deeply from its depths. Now his pack comes off and he sets it by the tree as, as well as the haversack. The rest of his possessions will stay with him, attached safely to his belt, should he need to quickly flee for his life in case of a sudden attack. Yes, these two trees will do quite well. And so he quickly steps off the distance between them. A pole of 10 feet will do nicely. He secures one from the forest around him and then carefully lashes each end to a tree about waist high. Tonight's shelter is going to be just a simple lean-to using the canvas for Mr. Ephraim Kane. His shelter up and a fire made, he begins to add enough fuel to keep it burning strongly while he gets ready to prepare the fish for his supper. But first, he's going to lay out the bedroll. That'll give him a place to sit while he eats his supper. He uses the back of the patch knife to scale the fish, scraping the scales off into the fire. The larger fish he fillets and the two smaller ones are cleaned and will be cooked whole, minus the heads and entrails, of course. He decides to use some of his precious bear oil to fry the fish in. He normally uses it for oiling his rifle, but tonight he will sacrifice some of it for his meal. He uses his finger to thoroughly smear the bear oil around the pan. When he is satisfied that it is well greased, he pours a small amount of cornmeal into the frying pan and then begins to dip the fish into the pan, coating them thoroughly with the delicious mixture.
A little precious salt is added from the salt horn. Well, the fish is done and flaking off the bones, so he sets the pan aside to cool a mite before enjoying his repast. The air is getting quite cool, and so he sets about to rebuild the fire. It is his only source of light, and he doesn't wish to waste any more of his candle, so he builds it up strongly once again. Retrieving the frying pan of still hot fish and placing his fork in the pan, he then bows his head in a prayer of thanksgiving and gratitude. The fish is so tender that the fork is useless, and so he uses his fingers, berating himself for not digging out his spoon. There are plenty of small bones, and so he carefully picks them out and tosses them one by one into the darkness. The fish is delicious, and the cool water goes down well. A sigh of contentment escapes his lips and he grins into the dancing flames of the fire. If only the folks at home could see him now. And with that thought, a stabbing loneliness threatens to overwhelm him, but he shakes it off, focusing instead on their happy reunion. His meal finished, he walks down a few steps to a small side stream where he stoops down and rinses off his frying pan and fork. He uses leaves to scrub and scour them clean. They will dry during the night while he sleeps. Back at the canvas lean-to, it's starting to sprinkle rain. And so he pulls his rifle, hunting pouch, and powder horn and places them under the canvas next to him. Next, he reaches back and pulls out his tomahawk from his belt and lays it down beside him. And then he dons his knit nightcap. He pulls out his extra wool shirt that he uses for a pillow. And then once he is stretched out and comfortable, he tugs on the canvas flap to give him added protection from the drizzling rain. With one hand, he holds onto the rifle and with the other, the tomahawk, as he drifts off into a contented sleep. The next morning, he's up bright and early, packed and headed northward. He feels good about his progress. He should get to the Ohio country in plenty of time to build a snug cabin before winter sets in. He decides to take a shortcut down a steep slope off a ridge. At the bottom is a stream and traveling may be easier. The ground is still muddy from last night's rain, and so he walks gingerly, choosing each step with care, 
All it would take is one false step on a slippery stone or log. his leg badly broken and with part of the bone poking through his breeches. He stumbles and staggers along, using the rifle for a crutch. Soon, however, he stops. By the side of the trail, he cuts two sticks for a crude splint. These he ties on using some of the precious muslin material that his bread had been wrapped in. The pain was intense and every move was agony, just tying on the splints and excruciating waves of pain through his whole body. But he had to get up. He must continue. His crude crutch made ready. He attempted to pull himself up using the tree, but failed. Maybe he could roll over. Well, that worked. He was able to stand, placing the crude crutch under his arm. He reached back and retrieved his rifle, cradling it carefully in his arm. He hobbled forward, putting as little weight as possible on the broken leg. Each step sent a shearing pain shooting through his leg. How is he going to get to the Ohio country now? All of his dreams suddenly shattered along with his leg as his hopes faltered of ever seeing his loved ones again. Would he survive, or would he be just another lifeless body on the long trail to destiny? <laughs>